Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank you for inviting me to Tallinn. Um, I was invited to present research on alcohol's harm to others conducted in Norway. Uh, I do not have a general approach like Toffee or uh, also Anne had. Uh, I will pre present a selection of research and which is not representative of all the research conducted in Norway. Okay. Uh, so I will present a selection of research which is not representative of all the research we have done in Norway. Uh, but I will, yeah, Anne has already showed this figure. Um, I show this mainly to show uh, an overview of uh, uh, the themes we have been doing research on within alcohol harm to others in Norway. And the themes we have done research on are highlighted with blue color. So today I will present research addressing the association between alcohol use and sickness absence. I will present some research related to drunk driving, a study concerning harm to children, and finally an article concerning violence. So the focus uh, or the research covers four themes, that is violence and sickness absence, which per definition harm others, and drunk driving, which might harm others. We also look at uh, the negative consequences for children who witness their parents intoxicated. Another important concern has been to address the above issues in new ways using different methodological approaches. Yeah, oops. We use uh, longitudinal data and we use registry data uh, to study the effect of changes in alcohol consumption on various negative consequences of alcohol use. Finally, we work with the Norwegian Institute for Public Health uh, on a project where we map alcohol use and drug use among employees using both self-report data and samples of oral fluid or spit. Uh, in this presentation, I will focus on key findings from articles published since 2009. Uh, in 2006, it's not uh, listed on this, uh, uh, on this uh, yeah. It was um, a review conducted by Baumberg, who showed that alcohol-related sickness absence from work constituted between 10 and 15 percent of the total global costs of alcohol. So there is a need for more knowledge about the association between alcohol use and sickness absence. We have published five articles about alcohol-related sickness absence and have used four different approaches in this research. In article one, we used registry data to examine whether an increase in the alcohol consumption on the population level leads to an increase in the prevalence of sickness absence. In article two and three, uh, alcohol and drug use during the last 24 to 48 hours is mapped using oral fluid and questionnaires. We know that alcohol and drug use self-reported by means of questionnaires often represent an under-reporting of actual use. By using both questionnaires and oral fluid, we can examine possible underreporting of such use. In addition, we uh, self-reported sickness absence due to alcohol and, and also reduced efficiency at work due to such use the past 12 months was mapped in these studies. Article four is a literature review of studies using individual level data to examine the relationship between alcohol use and sickness absence. And in the final article, we use uh, individual level data, or that's, um, yeah, I don't, 
uh, to examine gender differences in the association between alcohol use and sickness absence, which is then self-reported to be <coughs> alcohol-related. And we also examine whether the prevention paradox applies to sickness absence and both genders. I will explain this in more detail after. So the first article, uh, the aim of this study was to determine whether an increase in per capita alcohol consumption of one liter per inhabitant have a significant impact on the signif uh, sickness absence. So if the alcohol consumption increase, will that also lead to an increase in the sickness absence? We examine whether the impact was different among women and men, and for uh, beer, wine, and spirits. The data stem from annually registered sickness absence and sales statistics uh, for alcohol among inhabitants over 15 years, uh, from the time period 1957 to 2001. And we used uh, time series analysis for this. <clears throat> the results show that an increase in the alcohol consumption of one liter per inhabitant led to a 13% <coughs> increase in the sickness absence among men. The consumption of spirits, not beer and wine, had a significant impact on the sickness absence among men. Alcohol had no significant impact on sickness absence among women, and uh, there are at least three possible explanations of this finding. Uh, men drink more than women, they drink more often to intoxication, and they drink more spirits than women do. Nordström, the first author of this uh, article, he, he did the same analysis on Swedish data, and the results were similar with uh, a significant increase only among men. You have to tell me if I talk too fast or it's okay? Okay. Second article. Uh, this was a pilot study uh, where the aim was to map uh, alcohol use during the past 24 <coughs> hours and use of psychoactive medical drugs and illegal drugs during the past 48 hours. And we used both questionnaires and samples from oral fluid. Uh, in addition, self-reported sickness absence and inefficiency at work uh, due to alcohol and drugs was mapped. Data was gathered during work hours and we came, uh, they didn't know that we came, so it was uh, not announced, but they had agreed to participate. <laughs> uh, and it was conducted about, uh, uh, among 526 respondents from five different companies. <coughs> According to the analysis of the oral fluid or the spit and the questionnaires, at least 4% had consumed more than four units of alcohol the previous day. However, only 1.9% reported drinking a large amount of alcohol through the questionnaire. So the, it was more than twofold. Uh, the, the, the samples of oral fluid show that it was yeah, they, they reported about half of the actual use. And this is uh, actually consistent with the uh, studies where they have compared uh, data from sales, uh, actual sales of alcohol with self-reported use in the population. So it's uh, around half is uh, often reported in studies. For psychoactive medical drugs, there were also some underreporting, uh, while 
4.2% reported using such drugs through the questionnaires. We found that 51 had used them when adding the results from the samples of oral fluid. However, these, um, uh, it was mainly according to subscriptions from doctors. It was not above the, uh, yeah, so it was not uh, as bad <laughs> as it looks. Concerning illegal drugs, uh, we um, in identified from the samples of oral fluid and through the questionnaires that 1.7% of the participants uh, had used it, while only 0.4 reported this through the questionnaires. And of course, it's not surprising that illegal drugs are underreported as they are illegal. So. Finally, the results show that 6% reported being absent from work due to alcohol use one or more times during the past 12 months, and 24% reported being inefficient at work um, uh, due to hangover during the past 12 months. Uh, in this study, we used the same procedure as in the previous study. We analyzed samples of oral fluid and self-reported data from questionnaires to investigate the prevalence of alcohol and drug use uh, in a sample of health professionals in Norway. And we studied self-reported absence and reduced efficiency at work due to alcohol and drug use. A total of 916 of the 933 <laughs> invited health profes professionals um, from hospitals and pharmacies participated. So the participation uh, rate was quite high with 98% and 81% uh, were women. <clears throat> The yeah, alcohol, illicit drugs, and medical drugs were found in 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and 7.3% of the samples. So as you can see, the figures for alcohol and illicit drugs are considerably, considerably lower than found in the previous study. And uh, this suggests that uh, the alcohol and drug use vary uh, quite substantially between business areas. Of course, uh, the fact that this sample contain, contained a lot of women also explains uh, some of the findings. Uh, and we are currently writing an article where we compare alcohol and drug use between uh, different business areas and, and uh, the differences are quite large. However, when it came to absence from work <clears throat> due to alcohol and medical drug use, uh, it was, uh, well, it was not reported by many, but among those who reported using medical drugs, 16.7 reported, uh, reported being absent from work due to such use, and 25% reported being inefficient at work due to use of medical drugs. Several studies have addressed the association between alcohol use and sickness absence. But how strong is the empirical evidence or the evidence for an association between alcohol use and sickness absence? Does types of measures of alcohol use and sickness absence influence the results? And is the association different for women and men and in different socioeconomic groups? These were the questions we asked when we conduct, conducted our review. Uh, and this uh, is, to our knowledge, the first review of studies applying individual level data to address this association. The aims, 
so the aims were to assess how well documented the association between alcohol use and sickness absence is, to examine whether type uh, or measures of alcohol use and sickness absence influence the results. One might, for instance, expect heavy drinking or drinking to intoxication to be stronger related to sickness absence than merely drinking frequently. Moreover, many studies have discussed differences in the alcohol, in the, in the association between women and men and in various socioeconomic groups. So the final aim of this review was to examine whether the existing research provides support for differences in the association across gender and socioeconomic groups. We focused on studies using individual level data. That means that it's usually self-reported in questionnaires or um, at least alcohol use is uh, self-reported in questionnaires and sickness absence is uh, either self-reported or registered uh, by the workplace. Only articles that were published in journals, scientific journals in English, uh, dating from 1980, were included in this study. And the articles were published between 1986 and 2014. 28 studies, which tested a total of 48 associations between six different categories of alcohol use and four different categories of sickness absence, met our inclusion criteria. And 10 countries were represented, the United States, Australia, United Kingdom, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, Netherlands, and Japan, and Uruguay. Only four studies had a longitudinal design, and the remaining were cross-sectional. <clears throat> the quality of the associations was evaluated by examining uh, the measures of alcohol use and sickness absence and the sample type and size. I will not go into the details here, but the studies could get a score of zero to four points, and those who got between zero to three were categorized as low to medium quality, and the rest, uh, the four, point were high quality. So the results show that high quality associations were significant in all cases. Among the low to medium quality associations, alcohol use was less consistently related to long term than to short term absence with yeah, being significant in 25% of the cases for long-term and 100% of the cases for short-term. So the empirical or the uh, research suggests that absence due to the immediate and next day effects of alcohol use uh, is somewhat stronger than uh, for long-term absence. It is reasonable to assume that there is a wider range of possible causes for long-term absence than is the case for short-term absence. Consistent with this, uh, in a Norwegian report, it was estimated that about 2% of the total long-term absence uh, could be attributed to alcohol use in Norway. And that 14, between 14 and 19 percent of the short-term uh, absence, and 44, between 44 and 59 percent of one-day absence, could be attributed to alcohol use. Uh, this uh, report was published in 1997. It's uh, written by one of my colleagues. And things have changed after that, so, uh, yeah. But it's an indication, at least uh, the, the, 
we can be quite sure that there is a stronger relation between alcohol use and short-term uh, absence. We expected that frequency of heavy drinking or drinking to intoxication would be stronger related to sickness absence than merely drinking frequently. However, the association did, did not vary systematically across these measures. Uh, few studies have tested the, the moderating effect of gender and socioeconomic status. Uh, however, the results from this review uh, indicate that uh, the association applies to both genders and in all socioeconomic stra strata, but in uh, some instances more strongly in lower uh, socioeconomic strata. And this seems likely since people in high, higher uh, strata often have privileges such as flexible working hours, private offices, etc., which can, can hide absence uh, or inefficiency uh, due to hangovers. Uh, lower ranked employees may be monitored uh, more closely, so uh, it's easier to de detect uh, among them. And finally, we found some support for a causal relationship between alcohol use and sickness <coughs> absence. However, there were few studies who used uh, longitudinal data, uh, so we need more studies on that. So the final article on sickness absence, uh, we examine gender differences in the prevalence of alcohol-related sickness absence among young employees in Norway, and uh, uh, differences in the association between different drinking patterns and such absence. We also examine whether the prevention paradox applies to alcohol-related sickness absence among both genders. The data stem from a sample of employed uh, young adults obtained from a general population survey among Norwegians. And 49.7% were men and the average age was 28 years. The results show that men reported alcohol-related absence nearly twice as often as women, 10.5% versus 5.7%. And there was a significant gender difference in the alcohol, in the association between alcohol use and sickness absence for binge drinking or for uh, drinking to intoxication. And this seems plausible since the average woman uh, has a lower tolerance for alcohol than the average man. Or if a woman drinks the same amount as a man, she will get more drunk and so probably also be more sick the day after. The heaviest drinkers, uh, about 6% of the sample, accounted for 19% of the sickness absence. However, the ma majority of the absence, 81%, was found among the moderate drinkers. And this is an uh, illustration of the prevention paradox. Uh, it shows that it applies because uh, one uh, yeah, it's easy to assume that uh, one should approach the heavy drinkers in prevention, but uh, since the moderate users are many, they also uh, cause a lot of damage or sickness absence in this case. So uh, this study shows that the prevention paradox applied to sickness absence uh, among young employees and among women and men. And an implication of this is that preventive efforts should be targeted against all employees, 
not only heavy drinkers. Here, uh, I will now sum up some of the key findings from the research on sickness absence. Uh, our research shows that when the total consumption of alcohol in the population increase, the prevalence of sickness absence also increase. The literature review provides uh, support for an association between alcohol use and both short and long-term sickness absence. And the association applies to both uh, women and men and all socioeconomic groups, but in some instances more strongly in lower uh, socioeconomic groups. <clears throat> Our studies suggest that the prevalence of self-reported sickness absence uh, varies between 5 and 10 percent, and that approximately 25 percent report being less efficient at work at least once the past 12 months due to alcohol use and medical drug use. Finally, <clears throat> Our study showed that the prevention paradox applies to sickness absence, and uh, an implication of that is that preventive efforts should be targeted at all employees. We have published four articles on drunk driving uh, related to drunk driving in. Uh, Article 1, the authors use registry data, the same method as, as we used in the first uh, article on sickness absence, to examine whether an increase in the alcohol consumption on the population level leads to an increase in the prevalence of drunk driving. In Article 2, we use longitudinal data to examine how an increase in the frequency of heavy drinking episodes affects the incident of drunk driving, and whether the effect of alcohol use on drunk driving is, is moderated by the personality trait impulsivity. I will uh, explain a bit further. Yeah. And finally, in Article 3 and 4, uh, we used an attitude behavior model to study the factors underlying the motivation not to drink and drive and the motivation not to ride with an intoxicated driver. We also examined whether this theory is better suited to understand the motivation among young and among older drivers and among male than female drivers and passengers. Okay. So the aim of this first article was to est estimate the relation between drunk driving and total consumption of alcohol on, um, in Norway and Sweden. The data on drunk driving in Norway consisted of convictions for drunk driving per 100 inhabitants aged uh, between 15 and 69 years. The, the drunk driving proxy for Sweden was the proportion of all police reported traffic accident with personal injuries where dr the driver was under the influence of alcohol. And uh, for alcohol, uh, the total alcohol sales in liter of pure alcohol per inhabitant was used um, for people aged 15 and older. And the time period studied was 1957 to 1989, where the rules in the two countries, or the, uh, what is it called, uh, were, were similar. Uh, it was before any changes in the, yeah. Okay, so the association between drunk driving and per capita alcohol consumption was strongly significant in Norway as well as in Sweden. Um, that means, uh, I will, uh, yeah, when the total consumption in Norway and Sweden increases, so does the incident of drunk driving 
This also means that if the total consumption would decrease, so would the incident of drunk driving. The second article, um, <clears throat> okay, drunk driving is obviously, ob obviously related to alcohol use. It's, uh, you, you have to be drinking to, yeah, to be dr doing drunk driving. However, the strength of the relationship is not known. Uh, in addition, we know that not all people drive after drinking. So in this study, we examine how an increase in the frequency of heavy drinking episodes affects the incident of drunk driving. In addition, we wanted to examine whether those who are impulsive or uh, yeah, those who act on impulse or who are not, uh, um, I don't know if, if you understand it, but uh, if they are more likely to drive after drinking than those who are not. So we examine whether the effect of alcohol use on drunk driving was moderated by impulsivity. The data stem from a longitudinal study uh, called Young in Norway, where 2,600 participated, and the respondents were 17 years at the first uh, point and 28 years at the second point. And you might probably ask if they have a driver's license, but it concerned all, all motorized vehicles, also motorcycle and uh, not only cars. <clears throat> and uh, the results show that every additional episode of heavy drinking was associated with a uh, increase of 2.6% in the frequency of drunk driving. Uh, the increase for males was, a signif uh, was, was higher or almost, uh, not, to, not double, but uh, it was 3.4 uh, versus 1.9 for women. And the association between alcohol use and drunk driving was twice as strong among those uh, who were impul impulsive compared to those who were not. 3.4 versus 1.6. Okay. <clears throat> we know that most Norwegian license holders consider driving with a blood alcohol concentration above the legal limit as reprehensible or something you don't do. However, still between 21 and 39% of Norwegians that are involved in fatal traffic accidents were influenced by alcohol. And this suggests that factors besides attitudes might influence behavior in this context. Social psychologists have developed integrated attitude behavior models, and uh, maybe the most well-known model is the theory of hand behavior. This model has good evidence for practicality and also for uh, ability to predict behavior. According to this theory, the intention or the motivation uh, to perform a behavior is the most important predictor of future behavior the motivation or intention to perform a specific behavior is determined by the attitude towards the behavior or the positive or negative evaluation of performing the given behavior. In addition, subject, subjective norms, which refers to the individual perception of what important others accept, expect him or her to do, and perceived behavioral control, the perception of, of how easy or difficult it is to perform the behavior. 
In this study, we also uh, examined the impact of descriptive norms and moral norms. Um, descriptive norm reflect what is perceived as common and normal, uh, what most people do. So if it's common to drive, drink and drive, then it's more likely that you will do it. Uh, moral norms represent the conviction that some form of behaviors are right or wrong, regardless of personal consequences. So the aim of this study was to determine to what extent this model could predict the motivation not to drink and drive and whether the additional variables, descriptive norm and moral norm, uh, predict uh, motivation. And since men, men below the age of 35, at least in Norway, uh, are more involved in drunk driving than older individuals and women, we also examine whether this model is better uh, for uh, describing the motivation among men than women and younger and older. Uh, yeah. Questionnaires were completed by 1,025 respondents between 18 and 70 years. 46% uh, were men and the average age was 44. Uh, and and uh, we Analyses were only conducted among those who had a driver's license and who reported drinking at least one to two times per year. Uh, when looking at the whole sample, this model this did not work very well. Uh, and the additional uh, predict predictors did contribute, but only a little. However, the, it was far better to, uh, or this model can, can uh, explain the motivation among young drivers much better than older drivers and female drivers more uh, better than uh, female drivers. Yeah. Riding with an intoxicated driver increased the likelihood of being injured or killed in an accident. And the likelihood of riding with an intoxicated driver increase with low risk perception, social accept, uh, low feeling of control, uh, decreasing age, younger are more likely to ride with intoxicated drivers, and men are more likely. Also, if, as Anne showed, uh, if the uh, passenger drink him or herself, uh, it's more likely. However, we know little about the relative impact of these predictors, so there's a need to use in integrated models. And it's, it's uh, since the gender difference in, with respect to drunk driving is very evident, uh, young male uh, road users are involved in much more than female road users. So we also examine age and gender differences. So again, we wanted to, or I wanted to, <laughs> Uh, determine to what extent this model uh, could explain the motivation not to ride with an intoxicated driver and uh, to see if this model was better suited to explain the motivation among young versus older and women versus men. This, uh, the results from this study show that it is uh, 
better suited to explain this this motivation than than uh, dr drink driving or driving after drinking, uh, and and again the the model is better uh, better to use among young passengers and among male passengers than female and older passengers. Okay, so some key findings on drunk driving. When the total consumption of alcohol in the population increased, the prevalence of drunk driving also increased. Men and individuals who are impulsive are more likely to drive after episodes of heavy drinking. Two studies related to drunk driving suggest that the um, theory of planned behavior was better or yeah, explains uh, uh, the motivation better among young male drivers and passengers than among older, female, uh, older and female drivers and passengers. And since young male road users are the most important target group in this context, this appears like a useful approach for this group when developing interventions. Okay, so far uh, we have uh, published one article on harm to children. However, my colleague Ingeborg Rosso is currently writing a literature review on this issue. Most previous research in this area is conducted on clinical samples, uh, where parents have a problem or a problematic alcohol use. However, in this study, we use data from the normal population. The aims of this study were to determine the possible relationship between parental intoxication and suicidal behavior among adolescents, and whether the association is stronger among younger ad adolescents, and finally, whether intoxication among both parents as opposed to one parent matters. The data stem from school surveys conducted in Norway in 2002 and 2004, where 11,600 and 20,700 participated. The participants were aged between 13 and 19 years. So it's them reporting about their parents being intoxicated. <coughs> The results from this study show that the more often the adolescents witnessed their parents intoxicated, the greater was the share who reported thoughts about or attempts of suicide, also after controlling for their own drinking pattern. The relationship was, significant, uh, was stronger among young than among older adolescents. Uh, whether the adolescents had witnessed one or both parents being intoxicated had no uh, significant impact or didn't mean anything. Okay. Several of my colleagues have published research on the association between alcohol use and violence. However, I will only present one article on this issue. Uh, the aim of this study was to determine whether the relation between alcohol consumption and violence is, again, moderated by suppressed anger. The data stem from a longitudinal study with nearly 3,000 participants. Uh, at the first measurement point, the respondents were si between 16 and 17 years, and at the second measurement point, they were 21 to 22 years. And the results show that among respondents who reported a strong tendency to suppress anger, a 10% increase in the episodes of intoxication led to a 5% increase in the incident of violence. Among the respondents that did not have such a tendency, there was no 
significant relationship. Okay, <clears throat> a lot of text. So a summary of all the key findings. These studies, 11 articles, provide support for an association between alcohol use and four negative outcomes. Sickness absence, drunk driving, thoughts about or attempts of suicide among children, and violence. More specifically, this research showed that when the total consumption of alcohol in the population increase, the prevalence of sickness absence and drunk driving increase. The literature review uh, provides uh, evidence for an association between alcohol use and short and long-term absence. Our studies suggest that the prevalence of self-reported sick sickness absence due to alcohol varies between 5 and 10 percent in the last 12 months, and that about 25 percent report being less efficient at work at least once uh, due to alcohol use or medical drugs. Uh, we found that the prevention paradox applies to sickness absence, and an implication of this finding is that preventive efforts should be directed at all employees and not only heavy drinkers. This, uh, yeah, okay. And finally, we found that the personality or yeah, moderate association between alcohol use and negative outcomes. Okay, and uh, if <laughs> this presentation is to be distrib distributed, uh, there are the references. Thank you. Thank you.